to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ oh magnify the lord with me let us exalt his name together we welcome you today to our study of godly homes in an ungodly world. Today we're thinking about a very important subject as it relates to the home and marriage, and that is the subject of dating, engagement, and the marriage covenant that two people enter into. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, our lessons are being brought to you by individuals and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you'd like to know more about the church, maybe the plan of salvation, why they worship like they do, or just get to know people there better, they'd be happy to sit down and talk to you and especially study the Word of God together. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God as well. If you've got Bible questions or you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, whether it's this series on the godly home or any of our lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. Won't you visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you can access all our material free of charge, and you can also order DVDs, CDs, and audio lessons, transcripts. All that information is online. Just visit our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. And friend, again, we're so glad that you've joined us. We hope you've got your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God on these very important subjects today. Let's think about the subject this morning or today of dating, marriage, the engagement, and what all the Bible says about that. Priority number one in dating should be to date and marry a Christian. Choosing a Christian mate is a premier decision in successfully seeking first God's kingdom. Matthew 6, that ought to be the goal and the mindset of every child of God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If one of my main priorities is to seek first God's kingdom, to get to heaven and live in such a way that it glorifies God, then friend, choosing a Christian mate is so extremely important in doing that. You want to choose someone who's going to help you, not hinder you from getting to heaven. You see, one of the main purposes in marriage is to be an example and an encouragement and a help to each other. Genesis 2 verse 18, the Bible says, The Lord God saw it was not good for man to be alone, therefore he made a helper comparable to him. Husbands and wives are to help, to encourage, to uplift, and to, 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 to motivate and encourage one another along the journey to heaven. And thus you want to marry somebody who, and date somebody who has the same goals and ideals that you do. In fact, did you know that under the Old Testament, God's people were specifically forbidden from marrying the ungodly heathens and the foreigners of their day? Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn it to Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I want you to hear what God said to His people through Moses about not intermarrying among the heathens under the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 7, notice verses 3 and 4. The Bible says this, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Why? For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so that the anger of the Lord will be roused against you and destroy you suddenly. Friend, when we think about God's command here, why is it 
that God didn't want them to marry these heathens and foreigners because they were going to lead them not toward God, but away from God. Their morals were not the same. They worship false gods. And friend, today, as one enters into the age and the part of their life where they're dating, we cannot emphasize enough the importance of dating a faithful Christian. Let's use an illustration from someone's life in the Bible. There was a great man of God by the name of Solomon. Solomon was blessed with wisdom from God directly, divinely. And yet he squandered that wisdom. 1 Kings 11 verse 4, the Bible specifically says, Solomon was led astray from God by his many foreign wives. They had an influence on him for evil, not for good. And friend, that's what we're trying to get across today. If you marry someone who's not a Christian, someone who's not striving like you are to fight the good fight <clears throat> and to be a faithful Christian every day, then the Bible says you're going to be unequally yoked. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Friend, what greater yoke could you have than that of marriage where you have committed yourself to each other before God? You're tied together, and if one of you is having to lead and pull the other, that's going to be a very difficult road to go down. You know, the Apostle Paul mentions he had the right to have a wife for himself and to marry, but he also mentioned he had a right to carry along a believing wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 5. And so we want you to be very careful and I encourage you to be very careful about dating and marrying only a faithful Christian. Let me give you some statistics. A study was done where there were 79 people uh, studied in this one study where they married a Christian non-Christian. So 79 couples married Christian non-Christian. What do you think happened and was the outcome of those marriages, 57 of those 79 couples in each marriage where one was a Christian, non-Christian, the 57 left the church, no longer faithful to the Lord. 22 remained faithful Christians. 14 of them actually converted their mates. 14 out of 79 converted their mates. 25 ended up getting divorced. Friend, those statistics are not real good. But then in that same study, there were 64 marriages where it was a Christian, faithful Christian, married to a faithful Christian. How do you think the outcome of that marriage went? Only five left the church. Fifty-nine remained faithful to the Lord, and only two were divorced. What are we trying to say? In dating, cannot overemphasize the importance of dating a faithful Christian. But friend, as you think about the idea of dating, let's consider for just a moment, what exactly is dating? In our world today, dating is defined as social interaction or a type of, of courtship, getting to know each other involving social interaction done between two people with the aim of looking at each other's uh, susceptibility, suitability for each other as a partner in a relationship as a spouse or wife. And so we're talking about seeing if someone is compatible to be a, a mate or a husband or wife later in life. And friends, when we talk about dating, especially to parents, we want you to understand when your children start dating, they're your children, they're in the home, you're in charge. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4, parents are to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Father and mother, father and mother are the, the head in that home. They have the responsibility over their children. And so you have the right in the dating game to make the rules, in the dating process to make the rules and set the guidelines. Meaning, you should decide who they date, if they get to date this person, uh, when they date, what age they reach, where they're ready, mature enough to do that, curfews and boundaries and things like that. That may not always be the way society looks at it, but as the parent in the home who is responsible for those children, you ought to set the rules as it relates to dating. But then, friend, I want you to consider this. 
we need to explain to our children as parents what the purpose of dating is. Dating is not just to go and necessarily have fun, although that might be a part of it. We need to help people realize you're trying to find someone who's going to help you to be a good Christian, who's going to make you a, a better person, and ultimately who's going to encourage you to get to heaven. Parents have the responsibility to bring up their children to know this is what marriage and dating is preparation and choosing someone who will help you to be a, a, a good person in this life. And so you ought to do your research when you're dating. How does this person act around my son or daughter? Are they responsible? And someone who's dating ought to ask these same questions. How do they act around me? Are they responsible? Do they dress in a way that a Christian ought to dress? What type of people do they associate with? 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Bible says evil companions corrupt good morals. And so you want to get to know that person a little bit before you just send your child out with them uh, to, to, to spend time with them. What kind of influence? are they going to have on your child who you've tried to bring up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, here are some rules, uh, some guidelines that we want to suggest from the Scripture that would be helpful for a person who's in the dating process. And again, you can find these principles throughout the Scripture. What are some good guidelines to go by when you're dating? Here's something you ought to consider. When you're dating, you want to remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, and Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, remember your Creator when you're young. One day, we're all going to have to answer for our conduct. When we're dating, we need to be reminded God's watching. He knows what's going on, and I want to put Him first in the decisions that I make. Would I do this in front of other people? Would I act this way uh, in, in, front of, in front of God or front of, in front of the Lord? Is my conduct becoming of a Christian who's trying to think about God and glorify Him in everything I say and do? Here's another guideline. Don't use the same standard for dating that the world does. The world's standard is not the Christian standard. The Bible says, do not love the world or the things in the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Christians have got to realize our standard cannot be the world's standard. The world puts the emphasis on the, the beautiful appearance, on the, on the physique, on the sexual attraction, on the popularity of someone and how much power they've got. And yet a Christian, now I'm not saying there, there isn't an attraction. We all have likes and dislikes, okay? But we need to focus also on the inner beauty of a person. Proverbs 31 verse 10. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is perishing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Don't put the emphasis on the charm or the, uh, the dynamic that a person, the, the dy dyna dynamic out per outlook a person might have or personality. Remember, a person who fears God, that's someone who's going to help you. And so only date somebody. This is really important. You know, sometimes we think dating's fun. I want to date a lot of people. But you know, if dating is trying to find someone who will help you to be a, a good Christian, help you to raise godly children and have a good, happy life, why would you date someone who's not a Christian? Only date someone who's going to help you draw closer to God. Then, friend, we want to encourage this. Here are some rules that relate to dating as well, some guidelines. Do your best to not put yourself in a compromising situation. Flee fornication. Timothy would say, Paul would say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, about verses 6 through 10, flee youthful lust. Flee fornication. 1 Peter 2, verse number 21, the Bible says, abstain. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. 
Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8, the Bible says, Do not be deceived. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. God's not mocked. God knows. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. If sexual relations are only authorized in the marriage relationship, and they are, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. If it's only reserved for the marriage relationship, a rule for marriage should be, or dating, don't put yourself in a compromising situation. Don't let your emotions run high. Don't get in a situation where that lust and passion is running wild and you're in a place where that it could, could become a situation that's potentially dangerous. Don't, don't do that. Don't put yourself in a situation where that's going to be that way. Think ahead about these things. And then here's a great guideline. Prove yourself responsible and treat others with respect, uh, young men especially. A great guideline for you in dating is you need to be seen as someone who's responsible and respects other people. You see, all of us have been made in the image of God, right? Genesis 1 verses 27 and 28, the Bible teaches us, God said, let us make man in our image. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The person I'm dating is created in the image of God. The person who we're going out with, that person has an eternal soul. They're worthy of my respect, and I want to treat them in such a way that shows I respect them. I don't want to treat them in a way that's unkind or unloving. I want to res be respectful of them and their family in each and every way. But friend, as we think about the idea of dating and engagement, we need to consider for just a moment that, that marriage covenant. Malachi 2 verse 16 speaks of the fact that, that divorce is a violent act. A covenant is made and divorce breaks that covenant. Proverbs 2 verse 16 speaks of the adulterous woman who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. Ezekiel 16 verse 8 describes Israel's unfaithfulness and the analogy is made of a covenant with God and them breaking that and the, the harlotry of Israel there. And thus when we hear Paul say in Ephesians 5 verses 22 through 23 that, that, the, 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 that marriage is like a relationship between Christ and the church, you can see the example here of more than just a, a contract, it's a, a covenant, an agreement that we're entering into. And the bottom line is this, when we enter into marriage, we're entering into a covenant with one another and a covenant with God that is binding for life. I want you to listen to it. I want you to look at this passage with me. I want you to be, in, be mindful of the fact that this is a binding covenant. When I'm dating, when I'm engaged to someone, I go through with that marriage, I'm entering into a binding covenant before God that is designed to last for life. Listen to Romans 7, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, or Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law, so that she's no longer adulteress, though she has married another man. And so when we think about the idea of that marriage covenant, it's a binding agreement I'm making, and I need to realize when I'm dating, when I'm engaged, the seriousness of that. You see, in the Bible, there's also that engagement, or what the Bible will use the word as betrothal period. We see in Scripture that Mary was betrothed to Joseph, and the idea of Matthew chapter 1 is that they were promised to each other. They were going to one day get married, and they were working toward that commitment. And so when you think about the engagement period, you really need to be thinking seriously about these ideas. Am I ready to make the necessary sacrifices. You know, the selfishness of our society is so prevalent today. We've got to understand that a big part of marriage 
is being selfless. That successful relationships require me to think more about my spouse than myself. Friend, that's so contrary to the way so many in our world think. So many people think about self first. In marriage, that's not often the way it is. Ephesians 5, verses 28 through 29, Christ gave himself for the church. And he says, husbands are to put their wives first. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 4 and 5, we're to think about the interest of, of others. Philippians 2, verse 3, not only think about the interest of ourselves, but think about the interest of others first and foremost. And so as I think about this period where I'm getting ready to marry somebody, I need to ask myself, am I ready to make that big sacrifice? Am I really ready to live a selfish life where I put the interest of my spouse oftentimes before myself? When you think about the engagement period, especially as we speak to the man, you need to be thinking to yourself, can I provide for a family? Are you ready to take the responsibility of providing for and being responsible for providing for someone else? 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, the Bible says if a man won't take care of his own, he's denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. Are you ready to really take on that responsibility where you're going to be held accountable for taking care of and providing for your family, that responsibility, to the young woman in the relationship? We would ask, are you ready to uh, submit to your husband? Are you ready to fulfill the God-given role you've been given in the home? If When children come along, are you ready to help in the raising process of them? See, 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, the, the, the wife has a, a powerful role there uh, of supporting and helping and being the queen of the home, as it were, submitting to that husband. Am I ready to submit? Am I ready to bring children into this? Will I work together with this person? Will I allow him to be the head in a home, and will I help in every way as God has desired us to do? Let me mention this as well, and this is so important when you think about the engagement period. And, and, and sometimes, I don't know why, but sometimes young people think to themselves, if there are red flags, things that you know are not right now, you need to pay careful attention to that. It's not too late during the engagement period to change things. It's not too late to back out if you see things that are not right. If there are red flags that are coming up, if this person has a bad temper during the dating and engagement period, if he uses foul language, if his morals are not what they ought to be, if he's not as faithful to the Lord and his church, and those are red flags that are going off, sometimes the inclination is to say, well, I can help him and he'll change. Friend, oftentimes that's not the case. If you're dating someone who's throwing up red flags, those are probably only going to get worse. Very likely, when you enter, very likely when you enter into the marriage scenario. And so now's the time. Now's the time during the dating and engagement period to address those, to talk about them, to see if change can be had, and to ask yourself, do I really want to have to deal with this the rest of my life? And so when we think about engaging, it's such a powerful idea, and we want to make sure that each of us are living in such a way that our lives will bring glory and honor to Almighty God. I want you to see with me for just a moment Paul's words about marriage and some things that can really help us during the dating and engagement period is to realize from God's Word what the husband and wife and marriage relationship is supposed to really be like. Would you open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5? I want you to see Paul's words on dating and marriage and how it should be. As he speaks about Christ and the church, he gives us a great principle, a great guideline to follow for marriage in Ephesians 5 verses 22 through 33. Look at these words. Paul says, and he speaks to each person, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, 
love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. And he'll go on to talk about in that context that the relationship is really about Christ and the church, but what a powerful teaching about marriage. When I'm dating, if I become engaged to somebody, I need to begin to think toward what that relationship by God is going to be, God-given relationship is going to be like in the home. Am I ready as a, a young man to be the head of the home? Am I ready to put my wife and my family's interest before my own? Can I live that selfish life and think about others and their well-being and their spiritual growth along with myself as a wife? Am I ready to put myself under the leadership of the husband. Can I submit to this man? Will I do that? Because I know he has my best interest spiritually and, and is going to help me to grow. And friend, it doesn't mean here that the man is a dictator and you know whatever he barks out, you've got to jump and do it. That's not the idea. It's working together. Verse 21 of Ephesians 5 says, we submit to one another in the love of God of Christ. And yet we know the husband's been placed as the leader in the home. And so we hope today that some of these guidelines that have been presented from Scripture will help during the dating and engagement process and that people will really think about not just the fun and, and look forward to all that marriage gives, but think about helping each other spiritually, being a good person who's going to help each other get to heaven. Friend, that's what it really all comes down to. And so we encourage each of us to think with the spiritual aspect as we look toward that marriage relationship. Again, we're glad that you've joined us for our study today of godly homes in an ungodly world. And we hope you'll join next time as we're going to think more about the home as God would have. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.